Okay, welcome back to another episode of Releasing a Genius, where we interview extraordinary people and we find out what they're doing and how they got there. Uh, this next guest we've known maybe for five years now, and it's about time yep. that we got her on the show, <laughs> possibly into our magazine. Uh, so Shingai Menjengua, I'm sorry, Shingai, it okay. was good. Okay, uh, <laughs> she's the chief executive officer at of Fireside Analytics Inc an ed startup that develops customized online and in-person professional development programs that teach digital and AI literacy, data science, data privacy, data visualization, and computer programming. Clients include corporates, governments, nonprofits, higher education institutes, and high schools. Data science courses by Fireside Analytics have over 420,000 registered learners on platforms like IBM's Cognitive Class.ai and Coursera. This is actually how we met was through the IBM program. So a data scientist by profession, Shingai is the technical education specialist at the Vector Institute for AI in Toronto, Canada, and she's also the fa founder of Fireside Analytics Academy, a registered private high school that teaches high school students data science and offers the data science course curriculum to other high schools. Shingai's children's book, The Computer and the Cancelled Music Lessons, teaches data science to kids from ages 5 to 12. Shingai is an NYU alumna and a, with a Master's of Business Analytics from the Stern School of Business. She is a tech influencer and she is this year's recipient of the Emerging Leader Public Policy Forum Award. And you can find her on Twitter at TJIDO. All right, so Shingai, thank you very much for coming here. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, this this is incredible having you here today, Shanghai. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. I'm just so excited. Um, I, you know, I think for our listening audience, when um, when we talk to Shanghai and when we we've, we've had her over to our home and and we've we've uh, you know learned a lot from her. She is a very humble person, but as you heard, all the things that she has done is just incredible. As a person who has just gone out herself and she has said, this is what I can do, and she's just decided to do it. I think it's pretty phenomenal. Her, her as a role model for others, I think for a female, and it's uh, and not just a female, but for anybody to watch and listen, that this is something incredible that you can do. I don't know if you, you heard the number, I'm going to repeat it again, 425,000 people. I mean, that's your impact on the world is huge. Uh, you've written a story, you've got, um, you're working with IBM, all these other companies. Data science is the future. And, uh, and you realize this early and you captured it and you did something with it yourself. I think this is really phenomenal. So what we're going to do today is I'd like to first of all find out about you because you are a role model for others. And what made Shanghai Shanghai? Can you talk a little bit about your childhood? Where where were you born? And and then, you know, what brought you to this? Yeah, so it's a, a series of uh, coincidences. <laughs> like all great stories, um, and only some of it was planned. So I was born and raised in Harare in Zimbabwe. And um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And my undergraduate degree was a general business degree, um, PPE, so politics, philosophy and economics were my majors. And when I was coming to, to graduation, I was that student who really didn't know what I was going to do. I was good at a bunch of things. I had a lot of interests, but I just didn't have that. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a lawyer or I'm going to be a doctor. And just as I was coming up to graduation, uh, my brother, uh, I have two brothers who worked in finance at the time, said, hey, you know, my, my colleague from JP Morgan is going to be on your campus. Um, you know, I've told all about you. Don't mess it up, essentially. <laughs> 
So I decided, well, I need to find a job before this lady comes to my campus because I don't want to work in finance. And I didn't even know why I didn't want to work in finance. Maybe just, you know, wanting to, to carve my own pathway because I had older siblings, overachiever uh, older siblings. So um, I ended up just like bombing the, the careers portal. And one of the companies that got back to me and was willing to have an interview quite quickly was a company called Cinovate Aztec. And it turned out that they were analyzing point of sale data on behalf of retailers and manufacturers. So anytime that you go to a supermarket, anything with a barcode, when you go to the till and it goes beep, that is a whole lot of uh, data and information that's captured and goes into a database. And in that first job out of university, I was the person who would end up with that database and would end up providing insights and analytics to those retailers and manufacturers. So. Initially, it wasn't a, at the time data science wasn't a commonly used term. We didn't call it analytics. In fact, I remember at some point my mom used to say, um, "She's wasting her life. Can someone talk to her?" Oh, what really? Is the For <laughs> analytics. Yeah. Oh, wow. All this, I, from a loving perspective, yeah, yeah. parents always want to see us do our best. So they were saying, you know, couldn't she? She could have done really well as in medicine, or she could have done really well in engineering. But here I was doing this data stuff that no one really knew what I was on to. So it's, that's how it started. And then the, the world caught up to it. And then because everything became more digitized and we had these devices that we carry with us all over the place, everybody started using computers in the workplace. Um, all of those are sources of data. And then what I had started as, you know, by coincidence, I'm a person of faith, so I will say it was God. Um, so that's, that's how I ended up in this career. So how, how then did you end up working with IBM? What, what happened there? And can you tell everyone what you did with that? Right. Again, uh, right place, right time. So I, having worked in um, consumer packaged goods, we call it CPG, um, you know, this retail analytics and retail data, I, I kind of got to a place where I didn't want to sell toothpaste anymore because it's a very regimented, you know, there's sales cycles and then you have the holidays and then you have the holiday sale and then you track those sales, etc. So I thought, well, you know, let me broaden my horizons a bit. So I was coming out of NYU, um, out of the master's program, the business analytics master's program at Stern. And I thought, okay, well, here's, here's the test, right? If this data analytics toolkit is as promised, then I should be able to apply it anywhere. So I joined a TV station, TV Ontario, and oh, yeah. um, I was there doing anything data related, just again, trying to broaden my horizons and see what I could do. And I was pleasantly surprised that actually you can apply these analytics principles to any kind of data set, essentially. And that is what really gave me the confidence in, in, in addition to the master's degree to say I can start my own company. So without too much of a plan, you know, entrepreneurs, they tell us to have a business plan and all those good things. I was just, I just made the decision that I was going to start the company and then started putting together all my materials after the fact. And um, just right place, right time. I went to a meetup, right? Because you, this is what you do when you start a company. You print business cards and then you just start pounding pavements and shaking hands and meeting people. So I went to an IBM meetup and on that particular occasion, the projector wasn't working. So the team at IBM wanted to present Watson, um, you know, their AI platform um, insights. And um, they ended up just walking around the room to talk to people because, you know, the, the projector wasn't working. The pizza was late. There were, there were just a number of <laughs> sessions. And I ended up meeting Raul Chong and he says, okay, so what are you doing? So what do you do? And I said, oh, well, you know, I've got a startup called Fireside Analytics. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that company. And I thought, there's no way. There's no way he's heard of it because I just started it. <laughs> uh, and no, he said, no, no, no. Um, I was on an email chain today with Fireside Analytics. And I thought, how is this even possible? So anyway, we chat and I say, you know, data science analytics is my background. Um, I'm starting this company, I want to do consulting, or, you know, if you have a data set, I can look at it, etc. And he says, well, that's great, but we, we have a platform and we're looking for educational content where IBM is building all this incredible technology, but we need more people to have the access and the skills to be able to, to work with it. So, you know, let's get in touch, set up a meeting for next week. So I get home and then I am like frantically looking through my emails, junk mail, everything to think, what is this email he's talking about? And what I thought was an automated thanks for signing up to come to this event 
was actually Liam Katznelson, um, who oh, runs yeah. that yeah. thing. Hi, Shanghai. We're looking forward to seeing you at this event. That's and, and I thought it was an automated email. I thought you signed up to go to the event and they, they just... <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. and, and Leon is, is what, the chief innovation officer for yep. IBM yeah. Canada? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, then, you know, subsequently when I met him, he, it was it was just, you know, everything was so, so natural and so easy. We had a great first meeting and subsequent meetings, and then I started developing the content for IBM. Nice. Okay. So what you talk about being at the right place at the right time, and you've mentioned that several times, do you think it's just by coincidence you're in the right place at the right time? This is just for kids and for other people who are watching you. What, what, like, how did you get there and why, why were you there in the right place? What do you think? Is it a coincidence? What's... So, um... Here's the deal is that if, if these things don't happen when you're sitting at home doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So I had the idea that I'm starting a company, so I have to put myself out there, etc. So I had printed off some business cards and I was actively going to different events, you know, whatever was free um, to, to shake hands and tell people about my company and the work that I was doing. Um, at a different meetup, that's how I ended up with my first client, right? So none of these things happen when you're sitting at home. So the first thing is you have to have intent. You have to be going out and actively pursuing um, the thing that's your, your interest. And when you do that, you are bound to hit something, right? Throw enough dots at the wall, you are bound to get something. And that's, that's I would say, the, the reason why. But when we tell it as a story after the fact, yes, we'll say it was right place, right time. But in that moment, I didn't know that. I just knew that I had to go to, you know, four events a week and sh get as much as many business cards out and shake as many hands as I possibly could before COVID. Um. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you need to get there uh, out there, even if the your product or service isn't one hundred percent perfect, because it, exactly. it, it never really will be. Well, there's a saying that's called uh, "perfection kills profits." It's because if you're just sitting at home constantly tinkering, um, well, you need to be out there uh, talking to people. So, and one of the one of the things I, I've learned too is, and this is an eighty twenty percent rule: is get eighty percent done as much as, and then don't worry about that last twenty. You can get other people sort of working on it, but otherwise, it will stop you. And that's really what you did when you when you met IBM, and you said, okay. I'm going to have to create this course. You didn't even have the 80%. <laughs> and, uh, but yet you had it up in your mind. So you were prepared. And you could take action when the opportunity appeared. So you had that ability to do that. And I, yeah. I think, yeah. Did you want to I'll, talk? I'll do, Sorry. I'll just add a note about confidence, um, which is that's the piece of feedback that I get quite a lot from people who say, I want to start a business. I'm not sure, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um so the confidence I had was in the analytic skills that I had from the work I'd been doing and the master's degree that I had got. So I knew that in this particular domain, I can do something, right? And then the rest of it, I was willing to learn and willing to pick up um, additional skills. So developing videos, for example, I had never really, you know, developed videos in my past. Maybe I had tinkered with, you know, one or two pieces of software, but now it's a requirement in order to do this delivery. And even if I'm working with professional people, I wanted to know how they're doing it. You know, my vision, I wanted it to, to be realized as I saw it. So, you know, there's, there's that confidence that comes from doing and then that willingness to learn that says, hey, my bigger vision is more important than the little piece that I don't know right now. Ah, good, good point. Were you like this as a child? <laughs> uh, I'll go with yes. I'm sure my parents will say yes. And <laughs> I, um, I am, you know, a child of my parents in the sense that my mom is an educator, um, career educator, and she, you know, university lecturer, etc. And she specialized in then what was then called distance education. It's still called distance education now, but now it has a lot of connotations relating to online learning and, and that sort of thing. But um, in that Zimbabwean context, she was really thinking about how do we educate people in rural communities of Zimbabwe, etc. So that's what my mom was doing. And then my dad is an entrepreneur. So that's the home that I grew up in where, you know, you know, this, this business element that was just, we used to go to the shop and work in the shop every so often. And we always had books and materials in the home. So I, I really am a product of, of that upbringing. 
So can you talk a little bit about, too, the, the fact that you grew up in Zimbabwe, and then now you're in Canada. And, um, you know, some people will say, well, it's such a different environment. How do you be successful in a, in a new environment? What sort of things did you have to go through yourself in terms of, of thinking and in terms of shifting? And, and you had a lot of confidence in yourself. You clearly have belief in yourself. And, uh, and, and, but there's more because you also have to make shifts. So can you just talk a little bit about that too for people, please? Yeah, I think um, Zimbabwe is actually quite a unique country in the sense that it was a British colony. So my, that's where my accent comes from, um, from my teachers who many of them, you know, had lived in the UK and then were now teaching at the school that I was at. And in addition to that, we had access to you know, North American content. In fact, I used to watch some Canadian shows. Pokeroo, for example, was yeah. <laughs> was shown in Zimbabwe. So we had this access, this view of this world outside of our circumstances, and we knew that the world was bigger. And then in terms of education, I would say it was such a strong foundation. I, I would not trade my um, primary school and high school education for the world because it was such a strong um, foundation, the math, the science, the English literature, the arts, everything was in there. So from that perspective, when I then left Zimbabwe to go to my undergrad in South Africa, I mean, that was the first, you know, moving country and experience, having different experiences. We, we really did have a strong foundation in this, and that I think propelled us forward. So we didn't have that fear. Um, in fact, my sister came to do an undergraduate um, long before I did. She's eight years older than I am. So she came to Canada to Dalhousie um, and had been in Canada since. And she had been saying, you should consider coming to Canada, etc. So there was this relationship with Canada, even from before we left Zimbabwe. So there are many parents who are asking me now, you know, they're, they're really concerned about their children. How do we educate them well with this COVID and, and what's going on and what's important? I think before we get into that, because I want to talk about that just for a little bit, but before we do that, can you explain what data analytics is? Because you know, we know, and I think sometimes we assume that everyone understands it and the value of it. Why would they even consider maybe guiding their their, their kids towards this. Can you just explain the what it is and then what it's used for, for everyone, please? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to roll up data analytics into the broader definition of what we call data science. And I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. And I'll start by defining what data science is. My definition is it is the process of ethically acquiring data, engineering it, so we can get into a form. Then the next piece is we analyze it, right? So we can find some insights. We visualize it so we can tell a story about it. And then ultimately we wanna derive value from it, right? So that's the, the definition of data science. It's the process of ethically acquiring, engineering, analyzing, visualizing, and ultimately deriving value from data. And why do we do this? Well, we do this because we now have an explosion of data in our society coming from uh, digitization, from mobile technology, cloud computing, uh, a number of technologies that have just merged at this special time in our history that we now have data coming from all angles, in all professions, in all fields, along all verticals. So given that that's the case, it's really hard to escape it now. So a young person now, um, has grown up in a world, has never known a world without Google, right? So they already have this interaction and this relationship with data. They, you know, punch in a search word and they'll get responses back. And the, the engineering behind how the, those responses come back are a combination of data and technology. So part of why I think it's so important for young people to invest in learning about data is because I believe in the future we'll end up with a two-tier class. Of, of, of professionals. We will have professionals who just consume the data, who, sorry, who just consume the technology and the data because somebody else is serving it to them. And then we'll have the people who are creating it, the people who know how the technology works, the people that can troubleshoot, the people that can put up their hand and say, I'm uncomfortable with the ethics of how this particular piece of technology is being used. So that's why I encourage uh, students and parents to consider this track. And it's not just for the highly technical student. It's not just 
just for the highly you know mathematical student or whatever other buckets we choose to to um, self-identify so that we don't have to deal with it i actually consider it a, an interdisciplinary pursuit because we need the arts we need the historians we need um, the social scientists to have a relationship with data and technology so that in the future they are part of the the creation and the conversation as opposed to just the passive consumption I, I, I love the way that um, you've said that. I don't, Nathan, did you want to well, say something? I was something wondering if we could just give an example for, you know, these eight to 10 year olds um, who, who, who probably hear, you know, collect the data, engineer the data, visualize the data. I, I, can we give them an example? Um, <laughs> may, may, you know, maybe even like a, um, a, a hockey team, right? The, the general managers are um, watching who's scoring, who's getting assists, who's spending so much time on the ice and who are they on the ice with um, the visualization is then putting up you know and this is where art majors come in well how do you explain this story visually for people if play, player one has a 20 percent more chance of scoring if player two is also on the ice and that is how you're going to sort of then take that data and make better decisions as to what players are going to play on the ice um, i i think that's just a very layman's example <laughs> thank you that's awesome yeah. and well it's a good segue because i did write a book about this topic why so that kids can start to see some expression of data uh, represented in their world so they interact with it already the, any any device that you pick up has an engine behind it that's collecting data that's using it mostly to improve the product etc so in the children's book i wrote the stories about a kid who you know gets a computer for their birthday and then goes to school and you know the parents educate this child that listen you can play games and watch youtube videos all day on this computer but you must know that it has a superpower you can solve problems with this thing mm -hmm. and so the kid goes to school that day and you know is looking for a problem to solve essentially and when they show up to their math lesson nobody you know other students don't show up so there's this challenge of this empty math classroom and the math teacher says well we're canceling it we're just going to cancel it because no one showed up for the lesson. And so the student goes back and does a survey. And surveys, as you all know, are one of the primary ways that we collect data. That's that's what data is, is we just we're going to ask individuals, hey, do you like mathematics? Why didn't you attend the, the, uh, the class this morning? Do you like mathematics? Why didn't you attend the class this morning? And then ultimately collecting all that information empowered this kid to go back to their teacher and say, listen, children do like music. Children do like mathematics. Um, it was just a scheduling issue. And therefore, we shouldn't be canceling. Um, it's specifically music lessons in this case, not mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, and then that way, they're able to affect some sort of change. So data is not something that's, you know, far away and, and, you know, mythical ones and zeros in a computer. It's all around us. And once we're able to collect it and then to package it in ways that help us tell a story, we can really make a difference in the world. Well, one of the, uh, when I was talking to uh, a big, um, well, a government and quite a large um, well, province, and the person in charge of all the training for the teachers in this province was telling me that they were collecting all this data, but they didn't know what to do with it. It was almost too much data, and then everything fell apart, so they stopped collecting it. And <laughs> I could see you going, oh, no. Um, I, I think, you know, the point here is that in the future, well, even right now, but in the future, it's going to be even more important that we have lots of people who have these skill sets. And like you say, there's many skill sets. Um, I also, I what you were talking about with um, ethically gather the information, that will allow us to know the truths and actual facts. And it's um, as, a, as opposed to falsehoods. And this is a huge and growing, much and growing exponentially concern about the uh, truths and falsehoods. So you, like people who are teaching other kids how to do this and people like you who have this background are able to then get through to this and, uh, and actually try and find the facts, which are the truths. Yeah. And, and actually for, um, so I've taken a few courses on cognitiveclass.ai. Um, so if, if, the, if kids listening um, or even parents it's, it's for everyone, essentially. Um, can, can you just walk us through the courses? Um, are there open data sets available that they could probably play with? Um, 
who would you recommend take these courses? Before you do that, could okay. you just tell us the name of your book again? And then that way everyone can hear it and we'll put it up as well. But if you could do that. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So the book is called The Computer and the Cancelled Music Lessons, and it is on Amazon. So you can just find it there. The Computer and the Cancelled Music Lessons. Um, and that book we say is age five to 12 and five to 12 is a broad range. I appreciate that, but it's also, it's dealing with, you know, what is the internet? So you might find a 12 year old who spends their days playing video games on the internet, but they've never really tried to tackle that question. So that's why we say such a broad range like that. So to, your, to answer the question about cognitive classes, that's, I started there with working professionals, right? Trying to get working professionals to pick up these skills. And the cognitive class platform is for working professionals. So it's, um, it's folks who are trying to supplement their existing skill set with these new data skills so that they can advance them in their domain, in their uh, environments. And the reason they, they need to do that is because our education systems are incredibly siloed. Uh, I mentioned the word interdisciplinary. You'll hear me say that over and over and over again. I, I firmly believe that we do need to have a broader lens um, going into this future of work um, environment. So you'll find someone who has a finance undergraduate, a law undergraduate, a marketing undergraduate, and they've been working for many years, and then now they've been hit with this tsunami of data, and they're now required to produce reports on the job, etc. What do they do? So we are creating these courses that are short. Um, they have a lot of punchy. <laughs> they're punchy and hopefully somebody can take that course and have a better sense of how to apply data and analytics in their role um, and then so that's a working professional there are more formalized courses um, there's a, the IBM Coursera course now which includes some of my programming in it um, that is that's a certificate and so people always wanted certificates they wanted to be able to show something for the time that they've uh, spent learning so that is a paid certificate course. But the cognitive class, um, some of the core courses on there are actually free. So someone can sign up and, and have a look. I think the, the one that I would recommend someone who's never programmed, who's you know new to this environment, is the open data one. So if you went to cognitive class and you just uh, typed in open data in the search, you would find the this data science course that was produced in collaboration with the um, Energy Regulator of Canada for their team because they were looking to upskill their team and to become more data driven and that one was really designed to if, go from zero to hero you've never coded to now you're actually writing some r script and you're analyzing data as well so that's a good place to to start so could could high school students go to that yes high school students could and have so <laughs> I started, I started with working professionals in mind, and then I realized, look, if we really want to empower a workforce, then we have to go uh, further upstream. Uh, because if folks are leaving high school and entering undergraduate, not knowing that there's even something called data science as an option, then it's just by chance that they'll end up in the field. I wanted a bit to create a pathway for learners to really see it as a viable career. So I did create a curriculum for high school students that teaches data science. And we have a high school called Fireside Analytics Academy. At the moment though, our target focus is to work with the schools. So if you're a school principal, if you're a parent and you want to see this course in your school, then we have the course outline, the course calendar and all the pieces that are required to make it a ministry inspected um, course at your school. So, you know, we're being kept busy with other projects, with the private sector, with government, etc. So we're just saying, look, if you're a school and you want to take this on, we will help you get set up with the, with the course and the program. We'll do the teacher training and you can now offer this high school data science curriculum yourself. Perfect. Okay. Now I have, um, I have a question. We're just almost finished here. Yeah. And I, I always like to find out, you know, we talk about releasing the genius and really what it is, is when we release a genius in individuals, then we can start releasing the genius in this world because the individuals release it within a community and the community releases it within a larger geographic space and so on. Now that we're using online so much more and with you and you're releasing your genius in this field, how do you see that this is going to release the genius in this world even more? That's a great question. and. You know, the, maybe the best way for me to tackle it is to share some of 
the feedback and experiences I've had from people getting in touch with me on LinkedIn and on Twitter saying, hi, Shanghai, I'm, you know, in Nigeria, I've just taken your course. This is so amazing. I've never seen another black person talking about data science. I'm so excited that you're doing this um, from all over the world, from Europe, from parts of Asia, parts of Africa. I get these messages and, on LinkedIn saying, most of them are Shanghai, can you be my mentor? I studied this, this and this. Can you tell me what to do so I can you know, get a career like yours, which is very daunting. Uh, it's an awesome responsibility. But that's that is the, the how genius is spread. So this little piece that I took and I was you know, very passionate about and very focused on, on putting out into the world, the universe brought me, IBM brought us together and we were able to put this content on a platform. And then years later, I'm getting messages online from people all over the world saying, this inspired me. If that's not genius, I don't know what is, right? And yeah. that's what we're trying to do in the world is we'll, we'll keep keep putting our genius out into the world, we'll keep creating. And the effect that that has, when it comes back to us, it, it gives me chills. It's, it's, it's really powerful. That, that's exciting. And I think it's exciting that you're grabbing a hold of a whole new industry and an understanding of this world. It's, it's really exciting. Nathan, how good are you at data analytics? I need to take a few more courses. <laughs> Maybe I'll get some private tutoring from you. <laughs> Actually, your, math, your mathematics foundation is going to put you in really good stead. So that's, I love Spirit of Math. I'm a huge fan. I love your work. Um, and I'd say that's a really great advantage that you can give your kids as well, is if you give them a strong foundation in mathematics, then careers like data and analytics will, will be more natural for them. I'm saying all students can participate. Hear me clearly. If your student, if your child is more arts oriented, they can still work in data and analytics. But if they have a, a strong mathematical background, then they can do other types of topics. They can go into artificial intelligence, neural networks, and other more math demanding aspects of data science and data analytics. So you just heard right there that um, there's so much more. You've just touched on the little little surface, and I think as this world progresses forward, this this data science is going to become huge with all these other branches. It already has branches. And uh, yes, mathematics. Well, we love math. At least I, I love math. <laughs> and uh, if you understand math and you can think mathematically, it sure opens up a lot. I'm also, I'm, I'm a creative person. I'm very creative, even though, you know, people think if you just love math, it's one section. But actually, you can be extremely creative with mathematics. And, uh, and it opens up the doors to so so many other things. So you really wouldn't go wrong if you helped your child understand mathematics, looked at the data analytics, looked at even design, because you talked about design and what, how you can represent this. That's huge also, is just understanding it. I, I, this has been great. Thank you so much. Lovely talking to you guys. Thank you, Nathan and yeah. Kim. It's, Thanks, it's, it's lovely talking to you. Yeah. So pretty much what of what we've learned mom is uh we're gonna be sitting down taking some of these courses together uh <laughs> we're gonna be applying it yes because <laughs> I, I i i started taking these courses um right when we first met because I, yeah. I met i met shingai twice and then we finally started talking um and i i just i went on right away and it was actually fairly easy to do well in when i say easy to do i mean easy to get your hands in there um, I like the LMS that it was on as well because I could speed up the audio um, in case I wanted to go faster. There's transcripts on it too. If, you know, maybe the North American accent isn't easy for you to understand, you can read along. Um, so I, I, I personally really like it. Uh, I need to get more into it, especially if we're going to be implementing AI. So let's see how it goes. That sounds good. Even at my age, I guess I can do this too. Of the course, challenge is of on. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Well, look what you started, Shanghai. All right. I'm hoping that many parents out here, out there too, will uh, you know, reach out to you, Shanghai. Please do, because this is an area that you should be looking at very seriously. There's many jobs in this area for your kids. So way to go. And thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.